Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind by Shunryu Suzuki, also not by Shunryu Suzuki. <laughs> That's, More on that later. That, that uh, inf- joke will make sense in a bit. <laughs> informal talks on Zen meditation and practice. <laughs> That's not a bad joke if you, if, to, <laughs> if you know it's coming. If you know it's coming. Out of context, you won't, you won't get it. Uh, people say that practicing Zen is difficult. That's kind of taken as a bit of a fact, but there's a misunderstanding as to why. It's not difficult because it's hard to sit there in the cross-legged position or to attain enlightenment. It's actually difficult because it's hard to keep our minds pure, keep our practice pure in the fundamental sense. So in Japan, there is a phrase called shoshin, which uh, means beginner's mind. So the goal of practice is always to keep the beginner's mind. And this is probably the famous part of this book, which is sort of just caught on, I think, to a lot of other books. Big time. It seems to pop up in a hell of a lot of places and uh, the big shoe dog himself, Phil Knight, I remember that was like the opening quote of the book. So you could say that this uh, this idea inspired the whole of Nike just from this uh, one quote from this one book. Yeah, he's got to claim an IP there, I think. <laughs> the only thing is it's like one one sentence in the introduction that doesn't really come back again, but um, it's, it's, it's caught on. It's good shit. It went it's contagious, yeah. Because as we know, it's generally easy enough to maintain a beginner's night when you first do something. Like the first time you do something, you suck at it. So yeah. It's a beginner by default. Um, even the first few times you go out and try and do it, you're a beginner because you suck and by default, you're embracing this new challenge with a lot of energy and excitement. The issues come when you actually start to get pretty good at it and you start to believe you might be a bit of an expert. That's right. At first, you've got a bit of enthusiasm, a bit of, I guess, respect for the challenge. But once you get sort of half good at it, you probably slack off a little bit. You probably don't focus as intensely. You probably think that you're pretty good at it already, so you're not trying that much. And it's easy to feel like you're the expert, even though you're not the expert yet. In the in your mind, you are. You've lost that beginner's mind. Yeah, I, I think it's good to try new things, even as you get older, to realize how much you, you are a beginner at things. I had a crack at jujitsu. I, I thought it was pretty tough and strong before I did that. And then I just got started to get thrown around and by a lady who was probably like half my weight, literally, just started choking me out. And I realized, you know, I'm a bit of a beginner and I'm not very good. <laughs> that is a good reminder. So for Zen students, the most important thing is to kind of retain that, that bit of the beginner's mind or the original mind, you know, not to think, you know, I've been doing this Zen meditation for four or five years. I think I've got it worked out. It's to retain that empty mind so that your mind is ready to take on any new learnings. That's it, man. So, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities and in the expert's mind, there are a few. That's a big quote. That's a big you quote. You see that a lot on, on Instagram and TikTok, I'd say. Yeah. That's the quote. Yeah. If you're going to share this episode, just share that quote and everyone will think you're very, very wise. Yeah. They'll we'll think you are it. the expert even though you have the beginner's mind. So, in the beginner's mind, there is no thought of I've attained this, I've achieved something. These kinds of self-centered thoughts limit really our vast mind. I think anyone who goes out and claims enlightenment hey i've got it it's probably like <laughs> paradoxically yeah. the opposite so right. up yours eckhart tolle <laughs> does he claim enlightenment he claimed it man oh. he, he claimed he, he had he got in the start of power and now like he don't know what happened. he was about to kill himself or something and, yeah. then, and then he just like fell on the back of his chair and became enlightened, had enlightenment. Interesting. Sent this book to him yeah so, mate you're not there yet interesting i don't think i'm there yet so i'm Probably you're probably closer. closer than yeah. You, mate. yeah, interesting. Well, they say that when there is no thought of achievement, when there's no thought of self, when when we are true beginners, where we're not at the point where we have achieved enlightenment or become an expert, that's when we can really learn something. So he says that the most difficult thing is to always keep that beginner's mind. You know, even the more you kind of understand, the more important it is to think that you don't understand anything. So the real secret is to always be a beginner. So there's this word that keeps popping up in this pool called zazen, which I still don't understand what it means. I guess paradoxically, that means I understand what it means, <laughs> as we'll soon find out. I don't, is it, I, mate, isn't just that's the the practice that's sitting down it? and doing your meditation, isn't it? Well, you sound like you think you know it, then, mate. <laughs> so I don't think you know it. But zazen right. practice is direct expression for our true nature. So strictly speaking, for a human being, there is no other practice than this practice. There's no other way of life than this way of life, and that's zazen, mate. Zaz. That's it. We're going to talk about the zazz. Let's talk about posture. You sit in your full lotus position. Your left foot is on top of your right thigh. Your right foot is on top of your left thigh. When you get your legs crossed like this, even though you do have a left leg and a right leg, they kind of become one. They've kind of, you know, it's a bit of a metaphorical, literal representation, I guess, of merging into one. The position, it expresses sort of oneness and duality. It's not one, but it also is two and it is one. 
yeah, you've got your left leg, you've got your right leg, but they're kind of one leg. So it's it's not really two, but it's also not really one. Yeah, pretty hard to achieve that posture. But as you said, it is metaphorical for like other things. For example, our body and mind, they're both two and one at the same yeah, time. That's right. You usually think of it as one though, don't you? Well, if that, well, that's wrong. If you think your body and mind are two separate things, that's wrong. If you think your body and mind are the same thing, that's wrong as well because it's both two and one. It's not yeah. two or one, it's two and one. And same with death, man. After a few years, we're going to cark it. Um, if you think that is the end of your life, it's probably the wrong understanding. But if you also think that you're just going to go to heaven for eternity and just it's going to be rosies and daffodils and live on forever, that's also wrong because we die and we do not die. <laughs> that's right. And if you... Mate, I was, there was a dead bird out the front a second it, ago. I picked it up. It was definitely dead. Full stop, It's also I not dead though, yeah? I don't know, man. I think it was dead. Well, he's saying like if you think that, you know, the... Some people might say the body dies, but the mind lives on forever. That's, again, this sense of separating the mind and the body into two separate things, which is kind of wrong. Uh, it's also saying, you know, if you die, you're dead once and for all, saying the mind and the body are the same one thing. Also, that's wrong. So, as you say, it's, you know, you're, you're dead, but you're also not dead. I'm bringing it back to Zazen, man. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we know what we're talking about. <laughs> oh, we, should make some, we, we usually try and uh, bring in bridges between bits. Hard bridge here, but for somehow some the, the listener might just put the pieces together, mm. but this is somehow related to posture as well. Just take us on our word for that because Zazen, it is the purpose of our practice and that is taking the posture itself because with the right posture, you have the right state of mind and then there is no need to try and attain some special form of sitting. So just sit up mm. straight. That's the thing. So with this practice, a lot of people might go into their uh, Zazen meditation practice with the intention to get something out of it. You go there, you think I'm going to sit here for 20 minutes or an hour and you know, I'm going to do my breathing and focus on my breath and forget about everything else. And because of doing all this, I'm going to get something out of it. I'm going to improve in some way. I'm going to attain something. If you're doing that, you're doing it wrong. Mm. The whole point is to not try to attain anything. The point is to just go there and do just do it. And if you try to not attain something, you might be surprised that you do attain something. But if you try to attain something, there's no way you're going to attain it. Just like our old mate, what was his name? He, Who? The author. <laughs> Suzuki. Suzuki wrote this America. book and didn't write this book. That's there, So there's the, the gag from, from what uh, eight minutes ago has finally made sense. In the Buddhist scriptures, <laughs> won't even try that one. Someone Sutra, volume 33, it said that there are four types of horses, Ashto. You got excellent ones. Maccabi Divas, you got the good ones, you got the poor ones, you got your bad ones. Your mean streets, so I gave my mates a tip to 10 years ago and it <laughs> came last. Anyway. That's, that's a bad horse. The best horses, uh, you know, they're the excellent ones. They'll run slow or fast or on right and left. They'll be at the driver's will. They'll kind of react before they even see the shadow of the whip. So they know what the jockey wants and they're going to do it. The next best, you got your good. They kind of run as fast as the first ones, but they only make their sort of uh, change of pace when the whip touches the skin. Just the a little bit. Just a little bit. The third one, they're the poor ones. They only run when they feel the pain of the whip. So when the whip hits and they feel the pain, the fourth ones are really bad ones. They're only going to start to run once the pain penetrates the marrow of the bones. Yeah. Well, after all that, if you're a horse, you probably don't want to be getting the pain of the marrow of the bones, you'd think. Not really in the story of Zen, hey? Um, it's quite the opposite because if you're practicing Zen in the right way, it actually doesn't matter if you're Maccabi Diva, the best horse, just not copping any pain or Mean Street getting smacked up on the marrow and literally breaking your leg in the race. It doesn't really matter Um, because according to to Buddha, the Buddha actually has more sympathy for the worst horse than the best horse. Mm. Obviously, when you first hear about the excellent, the good, the bad and the poor or whatever, you, you want to be excellent, obviously. And you think, okay, well, if I can't be excellent, I want to at least be good. Uh, and you, you want to be as high up that pecking order as possible. But when it comes to Zen and when it comes to the big Buddha man, it doesn't really matter if you're the best or the worst. And in fact, sometimes it could be better to be the worst. Well, I think where it gets practical here is actually maybe the, what your own interpretation of yourself might be. Because there's a saying out there, a good father is not a good father. And if you break that down, if you're a person who thinks you're a good father, you're probably a shit father because you're mm. not trying to improve. If you think you're a good husband, you're probably not a good husband because you're not looking for ways you can improve. And if you think you're the worst of all husbands, you're probably with that intention. It's a real beginner's mind, you could say, because they think they haven't learned to their fullest and they haven't reached their full progression. So, they're looking for those ways of improvement. Mm. So, if you think you're one of the worst and you're trying to be good, that's probably a good thing. Uh, they say if you 
again, I suppose it probably links back to that beginner expert thing. They say that if you study calligraphy, you'll find that the people who are very skilled with their hands already tend to not be that good at calligraphy because they've kind of got that expert, you know, I already know what I'm doing in some other realm that should easily translate across. It's usually the ones who are, you know, they're sputting it up with their hands who have to work a fair bit harder to learn calligraphy and come in with that beginner's mind, that empty mind, that empty cup. They're the ones who can learn better. Well, that uh, came literally up in David and Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell at the time of recording. Has this been released? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it has, yeah. It certainly has a little that. longer. <laughs> But it has, yeah. It has. You gotta, oh, sometimes <laughs> break it a, a bit too quick. But according to our man, everyone can practice Zazen and it's the way we can all work on our problems and accept them and look at them. You know, you're always a work in progress. Whatever type of horse you are, uh, as long as you're just sitting in awareness that you're right here, right now, this is the ultimate fact. With continuous practice, you're going to realize that the marrow of Zen and acquire its true strength. The most important point in our practice uh, is to have the right kind of effort, the right effort directed in the right direction. That's what's necessary. If your effort is headed in the wrong direction, especially if you're not aware of it, that's just diluted or, or wasted effort. Usually when you want to do something, you want to achieve something. You want to attach your result. You want to go to the gym so you get some pecs or whatever it might be. If you go on just purely all about achievement, you're probably not going to be there in the present but if you're in the spirit of non-achievement, you're not just purely doing it for to get the good pecs, there's actually a better quality in it. Mm. If you're just doing practice for the sake of practice, you know, if you're you know, doing those curls for the sake of doing the curls, that's the right kind of practice. He's saying if you're doing the curls to achieve the pecs, you're doing it in the wrong sort of way. So it's all about whatever practice, you know, you're doing your meditation practice or your physical practice in the gym or your piano practice or whatever practice it is, uh, you want to have the practice of this non-achievement, just doing it for doing its sake. Because whatever you're doing is good already. Just being mm. in the gym, just doing the presence, there's always just something good, pretty cool about what you're doing already. You don't need to just add that actual future goal to it because you're just making it a bit more impure. Mm. It's like you're just adding, adding shit to it, Astro. It's like you got a bit of orange juice. <laughs> um, it's pretty good orange juice. But if you just throw in some chalky... It doesn't go well, does it? That's what they're talking about. Is it? <laughs> Is I, think, I think so. so Say something about impure impurity. If you're drinking orange juice, just drink orange juice. Don't drink orange well, juice. Well, chocolate is about the... Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's when a- it, something is added, it is impure. And when something becomes dualistic, it is not pure. Yeah. Okay. Just yeah, take that, me on. I'll just, just, I'll, <laughs> I like the gym metaphor you came up with, but I don't know about the orange juice chocolate metaphor. Well, it's it's impure practice, actually. Impure practice. Okay, so we want to be pure, you know. We practice for we want to be drinking orange juice for orange juice's sake, not to sneak a bit of chalky in there. So, really, whenever we're trying to do something, whenever we just sense that there's something extra or there's a goal about it, we're trying to add something to whatever the present moment is, and the present moment is what's pure. And in zazen, we're trying to <laughs> just throw the word zazen in there. <laughs> In, the, in Zazen, we're just trying to get rid of whatever is extra from the, the present moment because that's actually taking us away from it. I think it is, it, it is a bit of a one to have a bit of a think about. Like whenever you're doing something, you're doing it with some goal in mind. As you say, you go to the gym, you know, to get a bit stronger or a bit fitter or you want to learn a new musical instrument or a new language because you want to learn it. If you want to improve some, you know, your public speaking skills, you're practicing with the intention of improving. It's kind of interesting to... To think, okay, you should be just doing it just to practice. Yeah, well, the idea it's kind comes of hard without the without the goal, without the end point. It is. Well, it comes up in different books, say hey? the uh, the old intrinsic motivation versus mm. extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation. You're probably going to be in the present, getting a lot of satisfaction out of what you're doing. Ironically, you're probably going to be a lot better at it mm. as well. Yeah, it is in and a game of tennis. Yeah, different angles. If you're doing something just because you want to get to that end point, I think you're right. You're probably not going to get to that end point as quickly, which is a bit paradoxical, isn't it? If you're thinking, if you're just going out there just to practice, you actually probably overtake the person who's just trying to achieve. There's a lot of paradoxes in these eaten levels of thought, which probably go a bit over our heads, to be honest, sometimes. But we're, probably, we're sometimes more than a, a bit, yeah. <laughs> also, when it comes to study, Ash Joe, because we're trying to right now just figure out what the hell is going on with Buddhism, but... Unfortunately, if we're trying to study Buddhism like we are, we're not really studying Buddhism. Yeah. 
because the purpose of it is to study ourselves. Yeah, and he's, uh, to use a bit of a metaphor here, he says, if you want to know what water is, you need science. You need you know, scientists in a lab that they can study different elements of water. They can try to break it down and see how it reacts under different conditions. And kind of the more you learn about water, you kind of feel like, okay, yeah, I get an understanding of water is. But it's actually impossible to know what water is in itself just by studying it in that form. I think that's a wonderful metaphor there. It's probably like with the trap you can get with any sort of reading of books because you start convincing yourself that, hey, I know what this subject is all about, but until you're actually living it, you actually got no idea about it. A bit Mm. like water. You can study its molecular structure or everything, but you can't say what actually water is unless you could converse with water who knows what water is all about. (laughs) Basically, living it is the way to figure it out. That's right. And similarly then, if we want to study ourselves, we can't study ourselves just by being taught by somebody else. You know, if you go and see a, a, a teacher or a master or a mentor or something, you know, they can kind of give you something. They can tell you a little bit about yourself, but that's really just like the explanation of yourself. That's like the, you know, the stats and figures about the molecular structure of water. You might know a bit of an explanation about water, but you don't know what water is. In this case, you've got a bit of an explanation of yourself, but you don't actually know yourself at that point. Yeah, and again, the paradox here, if a teacher's coming here to teach you all about water, it's probably wrong, but if they're trying to teach you how to be how to be water, <laughs> then it's probably the right way. That's right. So the teacher, you shouldn't be attached uh, to the, the teacher or the teaching. You should learn to be independent. You know, when a teacher comes along, you should be ready to leave that teacher and become independent. The best teacher is not a teacher who teaches you what yourself is. The best teacher is the teacher who teaches you how to teach yourself. <laughs> Man, I think you just came up with a uh, she sells, she sells by the seashore, whatever they're called. That's right. What are they called? A uh, little tongue twister? A little tongue twister. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's what you want, mate. You want a, you want a teacher that teaches you to teach yourself. Uh, I'd say the worst teachers are the ones that just say, hey, here's the answer, go and learn. This is the right way. The best teacher is just the one who, I guess, the Socratic method that just kind of yeah. inspires you to want to learn about yourself. Mate, the more we try and try and recoup <laughs> this right attitude section of the episode, <laughs> I think the more we're actually ruining it. So let's just get on to our right understanding of the next bit. That's it. Right understanding. Let's bring it. Let's bring it. Let's bring the understanding about right understandings. Fuck, I'm just not understanding it. If I you're not understanding it whatsoever. If you want to understand Buddhism, though, it's necessary to forget about your preconceived ideas. You kind of got to give up all your old ideas, and again, start with that beginner's mind, that empty cup approach. That's it, man. Each one of us must make our own true way, and when we do, we discover that is the actual, the, the universal way. Mm. Because if you're doing it your own way, it's it's the way. But if you're trying to do the Ashto way or the Jonesy way or someone else way, it's not the way. That's right. When you understand one thing through and through, you understand everything. But when you try to understand everything, you're not going to understand anything. So the best way to understand the universe is not to try to understand the universe, but just to first understand yourself. If you can really master yourself, you will then understand the universe. But if you try to understand the universe, you're never going to understand yourself. So... <laughs> Another tongue twister from our show there. So, but to say we truly understand something, it comes out of emptiness, not filling that cup. It's actually having an empty cup. So, when we study Buddhism, we should always have the the occasional general house cleaning of the mind. So, getting that cup, whatever contents are in it, just pouring it out, making it empty again. That's right. You want to take everything out of your mind. Give it a good clean. You know, there's probably accumulated a bit of dust over the over the years. Dust and weeds and. Dragons no, and the weeds are, weeds are coming next. Oh, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> but the, uh, what they're saying is uh, sometimes you might need to bring some things back in, but you've got to carefully bring them back into the mind one at a time. Don't just dump everything back in and then try to take it out from there. He's saying the best way to clean is to get everything out, the, really the condo method of the mind. Rather than just try to take things out from a messy house, you take everything out and only bring back in what you need. That's it. Hold that thing in the brain and say, does this spark joy? <laughs> And then if it does, you bring it in, otherwise you get rid of it. Does this help me understand Buddhism? If not, out she goes. But the thing is, if you think you understand Buddhism, you don't understand it. Mate, we'd be walking around with just empty vessels if that was the question we had to... (laughs) Mate, which is the best way to understand. Jesus. God. Well, well, attachment, non-attachment, geez, let's move on to that. But Zen practice and everyday activity are one thing. We call Zazen everyday life... We call everyday life Zazen. I thought we were bringing this back. We're we're going no, back no, another three steps. No, it's kind of it's kind of bringing this back. It's like you know, you think you go and 
and I'm just going to sub out for the word meditation. A lot of people think, okay, I'm going to do my you know, 15, 20, 60, 120 minutes meditation, whatever you're doing. You think, okay, I'm going to go meditate. It's a separate compartment. Once that timer goes off or you know, once I'm done, then I go back to everyday life. You've mm-hmm. kind of compartmentalized it, but that's wrong. You're saying what you should be doing is it's part of everyday life. Meditation is part of everyday life and everyday life is kind of a meditation. So, you're saying that yeah. you, know, you do your meditation, that's the same kind of... Uh, attitude that you bring to the rest of your everyday life i think everyone cooks this including myself like mm. meditate like i meditate every morning but there's a goal to it so like to be mm. more productive and get all these benefits from it but in doing it you, you actually you know he'd probably start laughing his head off at us losers trying to get a goal for meditation because it's not yeah, the right, that's way. right you're never going to do it uh and similarly you know we've got flowers we've got weeds i've just i've had my garden growing for a little bit there you know, trying to get the good things happening, you know, my zucchini plant, my uh, eggplant, that's the things I want. And then every now and then some weed pops up and you think, oh, bloody weeds, I need to get rid of that. That's not what Buddha would do. Buddha would realize that, you know, weeds and flowers are just the same things, but we've got different names for them. A bit like human nature. We love some parts, but we don't care for others. Weeds and flowers, they're two names of the, the same thing. But the Buddha's activity is really to treat them all the same. I still think I th- Buddha would still get rid of the weeds. I think if you want specifically to cultivate as a king, we've got beautiful gardens. I think like if you if you go to a, a Zen, if you hear about some Zen Tibetan Buddhist bloody garden, um, twenty minutes away down the road, you're driving there and you're expecting something special. You're not expecting some weeds. That's right. That's right. But it's kind of uh, one and the same thing. That in all love, there should be some kind of hate. You know, when anything you hate, there should be some kind of love or some kind of acceptance. Anything you love, you need to hate a little part of it as well. It's, I don't know if this is too direct, but you know, when you got your zucchini and then up pops a weed, you hate it, but you realize, okay, that's good. The soil is clearly uh, a fertile one that can grow life. You still get rid of that weed. And then similarly, you love the zucchini, but you might hate, uh, I don't know, it was just a little bit too small. You want a bigger zucchini. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you bring this home... <laughs> Into the weeds here, Asha, which is probably the right way to do it. Sometimes when we're up in the clouds of Buddhism. But there's a Zen poem here, and I think this brings it home a little bit, um, or the kicker to this poem anyway. After the wind stops, I see a flower falling. Because of the singing birds, I find the mountain calmness, which is really true, man. Before Mm. something happens in the realm of calmness, we do not feel calmness. Only when something happens within it do we find the calmness. Mm. I Mm. I think with yoga... Uh, say, you know, yoga, you do a hardcore session for 50 minutes. That's probably when you get to really feel the calmness of uh, what's the end? Um, Shavasana. Mm. That's what it's saying. Or if you're out in the Airbnb trying to go out in the wilderness, it's actually hearing the birds chirp mm. is the the emptiness. Okay. okay. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and he's, another one, the, the Japanese saying, for the moon, there is the cloud. For the flowers, there is the wind. You know, if you see the moon, it's a big clear night. There's no clouds. There's, you see the moon big and full doesn't look that impressive hmm. but when you kind of see, if there's a bit of cloud in the sky and the moon sort of poking through from behind it then you can think fire out the moon's actually so massive uh so round just having that little bit of imperfection makes it feel even better i've got a half-baked story here which hopefully yeah. you remember to bring it home remember i heard tony robbins saying it about the person who wakes up they go to the casino and they win a <laughs> million dollars and on every spin and then they went and everyone um, treated them like God and, and a king. And then they went out for lunch and got the free lunch. And then they got home and then they had 15 beautiful, most beautiful of the their, the sex they're attracted to, just sitting there in bed waiting for them. And it's actually, you know, am I in heaven? But after 25 days of it, um, it turns out they're in actual mm. hell. Mm. It's every having everything go your way, it would be an absolute hell because you actually don't have, like they say here, like the cloud to to go over the moon for you to appreciate the moon. You don't have all those negative experience to actually start to appreciate the good shit that happens. That's it. That's it. You know, sometimes <laughs> that is not the way it was originally said, but <laughs> it's close we'll enough. I think I, I think it's just saying that, you know, in your in your in your zucchini patch, you need a few weeds every now and then just to really remind you how much of a treasure those zucchinis are. Is that right? <laughs> we'll end on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So what's more important, Ash Joe, to attain enlightenment or to attain enlightenment before you attain enlightenment? Mm, that's a very deep question, isn't it? Which is more important, Jonesy, to make a million dollars or to enjoy your life and your effort little by little on your path to achieving that million, even though it's impossible to make that million? Maybe ch- change that to a billion. This, this, is, this book's about 50 or 60 years old. 
Maybe we need something pretty, a bit more. Mealing's still really juicy, I think, but I think it's just enjoying your effort, little by effort. Mm. Whatever the present moment is, just living in that. Don't add chalky to the to the juice. <laughs> just funny. just live in the juice without the chalky. I that's, think that's the that's the kicker <laughs> of this whole book, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. I think the the kicker is saying, you know, it's not to be successful necessarily, but it's to find some kind of meaning on your path to success rather than just waiting for that end result. You know, that non attachment attachment. I think I I think it was better before that's I started it. adding more attachments onto this. So I think be the weed, eat the zucchini, and take the chocolate. 